there. Well, today I want you to remember one word. If you go out of here and you say, what was the sermon about? I want you to know that it was about grace. So we're going to be talking about the grace of God. Now, there's a lot of different definitions for grace, and you know, I've heard so many of them. Uh, you take the word grace, the G-R-A-C-E, some people said it means God's riches at Christ's expense. Others have said, well, grace means that we have received something from God that we do not deserve. You know, sort of the opposite of mercy, where you don't receive the punishment that you do deserve. Grace is when you receive something from our Lord that we do not deserve. But I like this definition, and I wanted to read it to you this morning because uh, I think it really sort of captures the entire picture of grace. God's work on our behalf that we neither initiate nor contribute to. That's what grace is. Now I want you to get excited about God's grace this morning. I mean, it is such a a powerful subject here, and we're going to be in the book of Romans, and we're going to be covering several verses, several chapters here, just putting it all together, because if you've ever studied the book of Romans, you're going to be taught the concept of grace, God's grace. It's just all in this, and Paul writes about the grace of God, and he just, he, he can't keep his mouth shut about God's grace toward us as sinners. Now, As I read this, I I learn quickly that Paul thinks this about grace, that you can't earn it, you don't deserve it, you can't warrant it. It is all grace, it is all God. So I want you to continue to think about that. Folks, today is going to be a service of worshiping the Lord who gave us this grace. I mean, He deserves our worship today because He has graciously bestowed His acts of salvation and His presence and His power upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have received something from this God that we definitely do not deserve. And that is Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. So I continue on in the book of Romans, and I start out in chapter 1, and I have a question that I want to have answered today, and that is, who needs grace? Now, first of all, I want you to know that really bad people need grace. Paul talks about the really bad people in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 29. He talks about those in 28 that have the depraved mind and they do things that aren't proper. And he says that these people in verse 29 in Romans chapter 1 are being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do those things the same, but they also give hearty approval to anyone else who might practice those sins. Now folks, I don't know if you paid attention to me when I was reading the list, but there's some bad sins in that list I mean, these are bad folks here, haters of God. These folks, they are disobedient. They are untrustworthy, unloving. I mean, he goes on. They're wicked. They're unrighteous. They're evil. They even invent new ways to do evil. Folks, Paul here is talking about really bad people. And would we all agree that those bad people need God's grace? They desperately need God's grace. But if you continue to read on in the book of Romans, go into chapter 2, you'll see somebody else that needs God's grace. Did you know that good people, like you folks here today, need God's grace too? Now, I know you know that because you've been taught that before, but we really have to allow this to sink into our hearts and our minds today. Good people, like all of us, need God's grace. Now, some here might be saying, well, I'm not sure I really need grace as much as this other guy over here. I'm not one of those chapter one guys. I'm, I'm, I hadn't done any of those things. Or I'm not doing them right now. I'm sort of over that. I mean, I'm a Christian, Brother David. I'm even a Baptist. I'm even in church today. Do I need God's grace the way that Paul mentions that these people who are haters of God and inventors of evil need grace? Well, Paul says, yes, you do. Romans chapter 2, you begin in verse 1 and go through verse 3 and you'll see what Paul has to say about the good folks. 
the ones who are in church today. Therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this? Oh, man, when you practice judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You may think he's not talking to us right there, but he is. In fact, do you see how the language changes from chapter 1? He says, they and them... Paul speaking about someone else. But in chapter 2, he begins with you. This is you. His audience, this is all about us. And some of us act like we don't need the same grace as those bad people. We think, well, maybe we have arrived. Maybe we're there and, you know, we've gotten past all that. We've got it all under control And we may not say it with our lips, but sometimes we act like we don't really need God's grace like all the bad folks do. Well, let me tell you, the Bible says that all of your righteousness is like a filthy rag to our holy God. Isaiah 64, 6. All of your righteousness is like filthy rags to that holy God. But you know, my experience is that people who are in church, most people in church today are depending on their own goodness to get them to heaven. That's a sad story. You know, you may think, well, I don't believe that. Look, I have been out to enough homes, to enough doors, had enough conversations, done enough surveys to know that people who say, I'm a churchgoer, and you ask them, How are you going to get to heaven? I mean, what would you say to Jesus if you were standing before him and he should say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? Probably 80 to 90% of the time when I ask those questions, the answer is, he'll let me in because I'm a good person. And these are churchgoers. These are ones who've been in church probably all their life. And I know what they're thinking. They got the list. You know, you check off the list. I mean, I go to church, so I must have God's favor. I must be a Christian. I must not need the grace like the bad person does. Let me tell you, being in church doesn't make you any more Christian than being in McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Some here may say, well, I put a little money in the plate. That's got to have earned God's favor. Folks, that is not grace. Yes, we should go to church. Yes, we should give of our tithes and offerings, but that is not grace. Grace is not something that you do. You don't get into heaven by something you do. We need to really dig into the scriptures. You receive heaven and eternal life and God's forgiveness by receiving what God has graciously done for you on your behalf in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says that Jesus was made sin or made a sin offering for me so that I could be made righteous in him. It's all about God. If you want to get something out of today's message and you're talking about grace and you want to say something to your family members who didn't make it today, tell them grace is all about God. God deserves our praise. God deserves our worship. God deserves our admiration. God deserves everything about us, all of our sacrifices, all of our life because He has given us grace. And that is what we could not do for ourselves. That's grace. That's unmerited favor. Someone wrote this about grace, and I thought it was a very good definition of what grace is defined as in the Bible. He said, when a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for this time, that's called a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that's called a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that's called an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize and deserves no reward, yet receives such a gift anyway, that is a good picture of God's unmerited favor. That is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. 
I don't know about you, that ought to make this appreciation and thankfulness to this God well up in your heart when you hear about grace today. So why are you preaching on this today, Brother David? I mean, you're not really going through a series on Sunday mornings. You just sort of pick this topic. Why are you camping out on grace today? Why did you get in the book of Romans? Because our society, our world today, is permeated by salvation by works. Now, we may say that we believe that we're saved by grace, but we live like we're saved by our works. And most everyone that you will meet when you get outside the walls of this church really, truly believes that they are saved by what they do. And that's because people just don't understand grace. They don't understand the grace of God. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that those bad folks, they need grace. And us good folks, we need grace just as bad. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, all people need the grace of God. In Romans 3, beginning with verse 10, it says that there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even, how many? One. Not even one is truly good. We all need the grace of God. We all need Him to act upon our behalf. And in Romans 3.23, I think some of you have this verse memorized. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many times does Paul have to say it? He is wearing us out this morning. Continue on in all of Paul's writings. It's all about grace. It's all about God. It's not about us. It's all about Him. We all need God's grace. You know why? Because every one of our holiness accounts have insufficient funds. <laughs> We're bankrupt. We don't have enough to pay the bill. We need a holy God to come in and pay it for us. He needs to stamp it paid in full because we don't have the funds to do that. You may be decent today. You may pay your taxes. You may hug your kids and your grandkids. But let me tell you something. Apart from God's grace, you are not holy and none of us are. We all need God's grace in our lives. We all need God's acting on our behalf in order to make it. Grace is a message that this world desperately needs to hear. Well, what message does the world hear instead? You need to try harder. You need to do better. You need to turn over a new leaf. That's not the answer to life. You can continue to do those things and you're going to be like a mouse on a treadmill. I mean, this, this wheel going around and around. Have you ever seen a mouse on those things? They don't get anywhere. And you can live that way and, and it's not going to do any good. We all need the grace of God because if we do better, if we try harder, we've turned over another leaf, then if that's all the hope we've got, then we have no hope. And what happens when grace comes into your life? Have you experienced that? So that's the beauty of the scriptures. Now, every person experiences the common grace of God. You know, whether you're a sinner or a saint, the rain falls on you, right? Whether you're a, a righteous person or an unrighteous person, the sun, sun still shines on you. I mean, it's not like there's the drought comes along and there's one yard that's green and one's brown and you know, God's let it rain in this little yard here because that person goes to church and this person doesn't, so it's all dried up. You know, it's not, God has a common grace for all people. He loves all his creation. So we do have a common grace. We've also got another kind of grace, and that's the saving grace. Again, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, how are you saved? Is it by your works? It is by yourself? No, Paul is wearing it out. In all of his writings, he says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no man should boast. We are saved by grace. 
And back in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, it says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul is all over this grace, this grace of God. He can't say enough. He cannot keep his mouth shut about the grace of God because it means that much to him. And he says, you know, when I've got God's salvation, he gave me that salvation. It's not because of anything I've done. It's all what he did. And he says, when I have salvation, I have peace. You know, in my testimony, when I talk about what it means to be saved and what it means to have Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, you know what the number one benefit I always bring out is? I got peace in my life. Before I knew Jesus, I didn't have peace. I was unsettled. I was worried. I was concerned about what would happen to me when I would die. But after I received Jesus as my Savior and Lord, after God bestowed His grace upon me, my worries are gone. I know where I'm going when I die. Do you know that? I hope you do today. I've got peace with God. It says in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that peace in your life? Do you have that peace? That is the greatest desire that I have, is to have peace in my life with the Creator. You can't ask any more than that. See, when grace comes in your life, you know what it does? It gives you peace. It breaks down that wall of sinfulness between sinful me and that holy God in a barrier that I could not get past but grace comes in and breaks down that wall so that I can be with my God that gulf between sinful man and a holy God that has been there separating us because of my sin God built this bridge in the form of a cross across that gulf and now I can go to God and I can be with him and I can have peace with my creator and it's all because God built the bridge I had nothing to do with building the bridge of that cross. He did it by His grace. He allows me to have peace in my salvation. But another special thing about grace is that when you're saved by grace, it's not just peace, but presence. Does anyone here know what I mean when I talk about the presence of God within you? Dwelling within you? Folks, if you don't know... Well, let's just say you have to be there. You have to experience that for yourself. I can't describe what it's like to know that the God of this universe, that Jesus Christ who created everything, is living within me. But Paul speaks in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that the Spirit of God lives within those who are saved. There may be someone that comes into this church today And you think, well, I I hear you saying that God lives in you, but I'm not so sure that God would want to live in me. I mean, I'm pretty filthy inside. I'm not sure he would really want to reside in me. Can I just give you some encouragement today if that's the way anybody in here is thinking? No matter what you've done in your life, no matter where you've been or who you've been with, it is impossible to move beyond the boundaries of the grace of God. Let me encourage you today to say that nothing that you have done is beyond the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when I start talking about grace in that way, and it happened to Paul too, I mean, (laughs) better people than me, Paul. He started talking about God's grace. And God's willingness to forgive and wrap his arms around those that have sinned against him. Sometimes people start getting a little bit worried. Well, does that mean that you can just go off and do anything you want to do? God's going to forgive you. Just keep doing it over and over and over again. And just flippantly, you know, turn your nose up at him and keep on doing it. And ask for forgiveness and do it again and again. Paul said it himself. He said, God forbid if you think of grace like that. But don't don't run off in that ditch and be a legalist either. You're worried about permissiveness? 
about the way the preaching of grace seems to say it's okay to do all kinds of terrible things as long as you just walk in afterward and take the free gift of God's forgiveness. While you and I may be worried about seeming to give permission, Jesus Christ apparently was not. He wasn't afraid to give that prodigal son a kiss instead of a lecture. He wasn't afraid to give that prodigal son a party instead of probation. And he proved it in the scriptures by bringing in the elder brother at the end of the story and having him raise pretty much the same objections that some in here might be raising today. That elder brother, he was angry about that party for that young son. He complained, Father, you're lowering your standards. You're ignoring virtue. I mean, listen to this music. Look at this dancing. And a fattened calf? You're just giving that young boy permission to break your law. And to that, Jesus has the father say only one thing. Knock it off. Knock it off. We're not playing good boys and bad boys anymore. Your brother was dead and now he's alive. And the name of the game from now on is resurrection and not bookkeeping. That's the grace of God. So we got the grace that's common to all. We've got the grace in our salvation. We've also got sustaining grace. And I wanted to camp on out, on, out on that for a little while this morning. Folks, if you're a Christian and you've experienced the grace of God and you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior and that cross has really changed your life, then you've won the war. The war was fought at the cross and Jesus won. And if you have aligned yourself with Him, then you have won the war. But do you ever wonder why those soldiers that have won the war with Jesus have such a tough time in the daily battles of life? We do. We struggle day in and day out. And we ask the question, why is this so? God, you said we've won the war. You won it at the cross. Why am I struggling every day? Well, one reason is because Satan's attacking you. He's telling you lies. He's telling you falsehoods about your relationship with God and how you have no power. And God doesn't love you. And sometimes it's our pride, too. We get so far down the road, going the wrong direction in the wrong direction, and we're too prideful to turn around and go the other way. Because what might someone think about that? Well, the question today is, God has given us sustaining grace. It's available. He's given you power to win the daily battles of life. How long are you going to live in the hog pen instead of the Father's house? Well, look at that story in Luke 15. Think about that, the prodigal son. I mean, here he is. He's gone the wrong direction. He's messed up his life. He's living with the pigs. He's eating with the pigs. That's not something a good Jewish boy wouldn't do. He is totally ruined. Does he stay in that hog pen? No. He makes up his mind. He comes to his senses, the scripture says. He says, I'm going to swallow my pride. No more will I live like this. And then Satan sort of taps him on the shoulder and says, You can turn around and go back to the father's house. But how will he receive you? Look at how you've treated your father. And Satan's always there to tell you that. He's always there to take away your joy. And God says, I've given you the power, the grace to win this battle with Satan. But you're listening to his voice. Don't listen to Satan anymore. And he's saying, but he won't receive you. Look what you've done to him. And Satan's lies continue over and over and over again. And it's fear sometimes that keeps us from grasping hold of the power that the Father has given us through His grace. But let me tell you today, if that's you, 
and you need to make a turnaround in your life, if you will act decisively, if you will say, no more will I do this, I'm going back to the Father, I don't care what anybody else says, what anybody else thinks, and not even worried about the Father. Because look at the story in the prodigal son. When the son came to the father, the father was running down the road to greet him. Now, I don't know if he was thinking, I don't know why he's running at me. I better start towing the back, backpedaling a little bit. No, but the father said, before he could even get out his speech of apology, bring out the sandals. Bring out the robe. Bring out the ring. Bring out the fattened calf. We're going to have a party because that son who was lost has now been found. The one who has gone away from me has come back to me. And I am going to just lavish my grace upon him. Today, if you make that move, God promises that kind of grace to you too. You can make it through this life. Are you going to continue to let Satan make a slave out of you? The Bible says in Revelation 12.10 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren accusing before God those of us day and night over and over. But the Bible also says right here in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're living in a hog pen and you think, well, I don't know if God's going to accept me or not, look, coming to God is not like you're giving him some new information about yourself. He already knows what you've done, and he is there with arms wide open, ready to receive you back. It's sort of like the time that uh, I was in seminary, and Jane and I had our little boy, Jake. You know, he was just about this, he's bigger than I am now, but he was about this tall. We would try to have, the seminary would give uh, students and their wives uh, parents' night outs every once in a while. Boy, that was nice. Uh, we, we really enjoyed those. We take Jake in there to that nursery. We put him inside, and as soon as we put him in there and the door closed, he started screaming and hollering. He ripped my heart out, and Jane was just sitting there. Can we leave him like this? I mean, he hasn't been away from us, and he's just he's having a little temper tantrum. He's rolling on the floor. And we decide, let's just go on. And there's a little room next door on this side, and there's a one-way mirror. And as soon as we got out of that little fella's sight and got behind that one-way mirror to check on him, he calmed down and started playing with his toys and laughing and giggling. We saw everything he was doing. So I don't know where you are right now or the things that are going on in your life or what you've done, but let me just tell you, God already knows what it is. So don't be afraid of that part of it. And God loves you the same way we loved our little boy even more. And he cares about you, and he wants to just wrap his arms around you and hold you and give you that grace. Today, I want you to know that God's grace tells us the story of God. What does it tell us? God's crazy in love with you. Every one of you. He loves you so much. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Do you know that? If God had a wallet in his pocket, your picture would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring. He sends you a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk to God, you know what? He's there to listen. God could live anywhere in this universe. And yet he has chosen to live in your heart. Face it. My friends here today, God is crazy about you. And he wants to pour his grace all over you. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that God demonstrated his love in this. That while we were still rebelling against him, still spitting in his face, still nailing him to the cross. That God demonstrated his love to us and that he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. That is love. And that love didn't stop on the cross. It continues today. God wants to pour out his grace on you to make it through this life, to give you salvation. So how will you respond to that grace today? Well, Some people say, Brother David, 
that is just too easy. That, that's, that's cheap grace. Grace, everybody listen, I'm getting close to the end. Everybody listening? Grace is not cheap. Grace is not easy. He paid the price. He did all the work. The blood was real. The cross was heavy. The pain was excruciating. No, grace is not easy. You can call grace a lot of things. Call it simple if you want to. But grace is not easy. So call it what it is. Amazing grace. And receive it for yourselves today.